party with flowers. But essentially, uh, I think, I'm, I'm not sure about this, whether this is true or not, but I think that uh, this whole puja idea is a basically Indian idea, Indic idea, whereas the, the flame worship is an idea that the Aryans brought with them when they came into India from uh, Central Asia. The flame, worship of the flame and all that seems to be more a manifestation of a mobile people like the cattle herding pastoralists where they stay in one place and another place. Whereas uh, Puja uh, is uh, of a more sedentary people. People who live in the forest but live in the same forest. So they know at different times of the year which flowers and which fruit come in and they can make the offering because they're not going anywhere, they're in the same area. But with the pastoral people in the summertime they're somewhere, in the wintertime they're somewhere else. So they take what can they can travel with and so fire travels with them. And the gods are propitiated not with permanent uh, sculpture and ideas, but just the flame itself. So that may be... Uh, and then of course over time these things all uh, get mixed up. And uh, so rather than excluding them, they become all three, uh, all three forms of worship. Now I think pretty much the sacrificial form of killing... Uh, is uh, subordinate. I think it's declining pretty much. They still have a sacrifice in Gujarat, but what they do is they, they use surrogates. First, they use, they use animals, now they use uh, like uh, watermelons that they cut. So it's this kind of idea of blood offering. The idea of blood offering, of course, is a very powerful one because it really comes from self sacrifice. What can be more valuable for me to offer you that I value more than anything else is but my life, myself. And uh, a very famous notion of worship, the terminal worship is known as Kamal Puja, where the worshipper essentially behaves himself or kills himself in front of the deity. See, my life is over, now I surrender myself to you, then he will either, uh, mo this is not done mainly by Brahmins and stuff, mainly by Kshatriyas, I think, and they would uh, go to a Shiva temple and run a sword through their neck, so try and cut their heads off or blow a bullet through their brain, mm. those kinds of things. Now, one last thing before I let you go, um, is the, um, the role of music in, in Hinduism. I, I didn't go into a single Hindu temple without hearing this sort of penetrating, um, you know, uh, tunes that, that, that they play. I was just wondering how, uh, what role does that, that, that have in, in, in Hindu ritual? Well, I mean, there are many forms of music in any Hindu ritual. Uh, first, we can start with the, what we call Beej Mantra, which has um, uh, uh, primordial or primary sound, like the sound Om, Prem, Klim. These have no meaning other than meanings that are ascribed to them. Uh, it's not like the phrase, what's your name Paul? Those sounds convey a particular specific meaning, asking what is Paul? What is the meaning of your name. Om doesn't say anything that way. You have to know what it means, just as you have to know what a swastika means. So that is something that is said in all worship. Whether it is, whether you hear it or it's in, in not sound, sounded, if, if, even if it's not said, that is spoken without loudly speaking, internally speaking. Then, beside that sound, there's the sound of the prayers itself. Straightforward prayers are two forms, at least two types of prayers we have. One are praise songs, essentially praising the Divine for the attributes it has. You with the peacock feather, you with the 
beautiful white eyes, you with the beautiful yellow clothes, you who killed such and such demon, you who protected such and such saint, you who did this marvelous miracle to save the uh, sea from whatever. So that that is uh, what I be, uh, what I would call praise song. Uh, then there the are these besides these they are called the others called shama stotra, which means uh, verses of forgiveness. A verse of forgiveness would say, uh, "I am nothing. Uh, I have no property. I have no wisdom. I have no capacity." I am such a simple person, but forgive my lack of all these things, but accept me as your devotee. Or say, I don't have all these things like food and fruit and food and wealth and gold and I can't worship you with all the materiality of the world, but I will put this leaf before you and please consider that as my thing for you. So these Shamastotras essentially say, are used to diminish yourself, to make yourself insignificant. Imagine you are uh, the most powerful king in the world. And when such a king goes and says such a thing before the deity, he is saying, I am nothing, uh, nothing before you. Or, or uh, he means that uh, sincerely that he is nothing. Uh, so besides the praise song and the samastotra, then there can also be uh, certain kinds of what we would call prayers in the Western tradition. Uh, they are not so many, but they are there. Where people ask, give me this and give me that, and following things and following things, whatever. Now these can be recited as prayers, uh, and therefore to your ear they would sound like song. Uh, or often it would say that, uh, often told in the way that, such and such saint did this, or such and such saint did that, or some other person like himself, person who had done it, and is recounting the benediction and the support the Divine had given to that person. And of course, he is now recalling that. So it has a sense of praise, but you can all, it, people can also say that, you know, my child is uh, suffering from insomnia, my wife has got cancer, Oh, help me, Lord, and that can be either in a prayer form or it can be simply uttered words, you know, uh, personal kind of thing. So these are the three or four where you don't need anything else. Now, in addition to that, there are what we call the songs that are sung uh, in, uh, in group fashion. So, for instance, at the Aarti, at the Shakti Ma Aarti, or at the many of the Swaminar and Aarti, everybody knows the verses of the Aarti to be sung. So, one person may leave the Aarti, or the priest may, or some drummer boy may, but everybody else clapping their hands and singing along, because everybody knows it's like the national anthem of the American people. Everybody knows it. Everybody in that sect will know it, so they will sing with it. And the merit of that singing together is to make merging of plurality of voices into one voice. So that is how a community comes together in the adoration of the divine. So they are all merging by the, by the plurality of the voices, singing the same thing. They are creating what is called dhvani. Dhvani is like resonance. And that resonance is a powerful uh, attractant to the divine. You can create the dhvani by yourself, but a congregation can do it. Now, there may be many hymns to Swami Narayan Bhagavan, uh, and uh, there may be certain hymns sung, sung to him or to Shakti Ma others, depending on the calendar, annual calendar, biannual calendar, five, an five uh, annual calendar, uh, whatever. There are certain periodic times when the Divine did certain things. And so that day 